And it's amazing, they say that you can wrestle light from darkness. Today's proof that you can also wrestle extreme warmth from the cold. <laughs> I don't know about you, but it feels great this morning. Nice and warm, and everybody's participating and singing. It's wonderful. As uh, Elizabeth explained in this morning's parasha, we read about the final three plagues which God brought upon Egypt. So having recalled all ten plagues, I want to ask you a question. Do any of you have a favorite plague? <laughs> okay. oh, well, may maybe not a favorite plague in such words, but if I rephrase the question, um, if you were living in Egypt during the time of the plagues, which plague would you find to be the worst and the most horrendous of the plagues, and which would you find to be the easiest to live with. Now, I'm sure you wouldn't like it too much if all your water turned to blood, and if you had no clean water. Um, and you probably wouldn't be too thrilled if your body was inflicted with boils and pestilence, or all your cattle was destroyed. Um, yeah, maybe you could live with a little bit of hail, that's no big deal. But one plague that I think that perhaps we can all live with, because we do all the time, is the ninth plague. And you might remember that the ninth plague is the plague of darkness. Think about it. We spend half our day in the dark, don't we? Especially, especially in the winter. Um, at night, you know, by the time you get up in the morning, half our 24 hours is already gone at dark. And at certain times of the year, it's more than the half of our days. And I'm sure many of you, um, perhaps well before my time, if there are some before my time, remember the good old days before electricity. No, nobody here remembers before electricity. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't in, oh, we've got one here. One hand goes up. Okay, good. Um, when nighttime truly did mean darkness. So, if you really think about it, the plague of darkness wasn't really such a terrible thing. Now, if you're sitting in the dark, you can always do what? Light a candle, kindle a lamp, and you can always turn on a light. That's because most people have it in their power to do something about the darkness. And because darkness occurs so frequently, we're used to it, and sort of we're content sort of, to be in the dark. You know the old story of how many Jewish mothers does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> What's the answer? None! I'll sit in the dark! Okay? But if darkness is no big deal, why is it a plague? And the ninth one at that, remember the plagues got... They, they got worse as time went on. There was greater severity with them. And this was number nine. And the answer is that the plague of darkness wasn't just about darkness, um, as in the lack of sunlight. It wasn't just meant to impose a physical hardship or devastation on Egypt like other plagues. Rather, it was a spiritual darkness, a darkness of the soul, the antidote for which is given in the Torah. And it's a lasting lesson to us on how to cope with the inevitable darkness which comes into our lives at times. And we all have times when our life appears suddenly very dark. So let's look at this plague of darkness a little closer. The Torah tells us, and I quote, Then the Lord said to Moses, Hold out your arm towards the sky, that there may be darkness upon the land of Egypt. A darkness that can be touched. Moses held out his arm toward the sky and a thick darkness descended upon the land of Egypt for three days. People could not see one another and for three days no one could get up from where he was. But all the Israelites enjoyed light in their dwellings. Now the rabbis tell us that the Darkness which enveloped Egypt was a special kind of darkness, not the kind of darkness that uh, we are used to. Unless, of course, you lived in London in the 60s. 
and grew up, you had what's called the pea supers. And I remember, I remember walking to school as a, a little kid, and it was uh, you know eight o'clock in the morning. It was pitch dark, and you could actually feel the darkness. It was actually when you got to school, it was like little flakes only from the, it was the coal, it was when they used to burn the power station. So, unless it was one of those, okay, but I digress. <laughs> they say, that, um, what, it, what the, ra the rabbis tell us is this darkness really en enveloped, it was a special kind of darkness. It was a different type of darkness. The people couldn't see one another. Um, you see, when a person doesn't see others and does not get up to help them. When a person is not sensitive to the difficulties and the conditions of others, then he is living in a darkness like in Egypt. And according to the rabbis, this is the worst kind of darkness, the kind which prevents us from connecting with and associating with and creating a bond with and helping others. And that is why the plague was so severe. It teaches us that our indifference, our inability to see each other, to reach out and establish a bond or a connection to each other, to help each other, to understand each other's pain or suffering is actually the worst kind of darkness. And that's, that's what happened in Egypt. They were blinded by darkness. They couldn't see the pain of the children of Israel for 200 years. They were treated as with such terrible servitude. They didn't care. The Egyptians didn't care. They got on with their lives. It was just like those people who lived near Auschwitz and claimed that they had no idea that there were gas chambers or crematorium going on. That They didn't know what was going on there. They just lived their lives. They lived in dark, in the dark of self-imposed darkness. And it's certainly like those today who deliberately ignore the atrocities committed by Hamas Yimachshimam Zichram. And so God said to the Egyptians, you want to live in the dark? You want to ignore the suffering of the Hebrews and those around you? Fine. I'll see to it that you really come to know what darkness is. What being alone is really like. What not being able to seek your neighbor's help really means. I will show you what true darkness is. Not because I have any hope that you will change your ways. Not because I believe that Pharaoh will have a change of mind or a change of heart. But I will show you so that in the future, perhaps others will learn from this and change their behavior accordingly. Physically, the Egyptians were able to see. But they did not see the pain and the hurt of those around them. They didn't feel or care enough for one another. And this is what the Torah meant when it says they saw not one another. They were blind to the needs of the other. And that perhaps is the worst darkness of all. Have we yet to learn this lesson? As I said, we know what didn't happen during World War II. And we know what's happening around us today. But that doesn't mean that we still don't have to take this lesson with us and learn from it in our daily lives. Darkness, my friends, takes many forms. We see it in the physical darkness, which is brought on by the lack of light. We see it in the evil, which is too prevalent in today's society. We see it with our own parliamentarians and our own politicians today, who say nothing, who keep shtum. We also see it in the hardships that we face in our own daily lives. And then there is the spiritual darkness, an emotional darkness, brought on by our own self-imposed exile from one another and from God. Sometimes it appears that we can't see the light. We can't see our way out of the darkness. 
And so we let the darkness envelop and consume us. Which is why, if we ourselves, like that Jewish mother, prefer to sit in the dark, if we ourselves prefer to hibernate and isolate ourselves from others, and if we ourselves choose not to get involved in helping those who need it the most, it is as though we are imposing our own plague of darkness on ourselves. And because we know how devastating that can be, the lesson of the Torah is not to do so. Not to impose any darkness on ourselves, and certainly not to impose it on others. However, as I said, the Torah does provide an antidote to the plague of darkness. A way out of our own darkness, whether self-imposed or imposed by others. The Torah tells us, and I quote, all the Israelites enjoyed light in their dwellings. It wasn't just that the darkness didn't fall on the land of Goshen, where the Israelites lived. The darkness didn't reach Goshen because of how the Israelites lived. They lived with light, not just sunlight, but with the light of God, which they used to help them get through the darkness of the slavery. If it wasn't for their belief in God, they would never have made it. They lived with light because they were connected with others. They helped each other. They cared for one another. And they didn't allow their own hardships and their own darkness to isolate themselves from each other. That, my friends, is the eternal lesson and message of the plague of darkness. <clears throat> and it is the lesson that has allowed Israelis to persevere over these past months. Because how they did it, I just don't know. And I can only think that it is because of this. This lesson is reinforced in the story of a sage rabbi who once asked his pupils, how do you tell when the dark of night is concluded and the light of the new day begins? Now this is a, actually a question in the tongue, um, because we have to know this when we do tefillah, when we do prayers of shachrit, how do we know when the actual darkness of night has now moved towards the early, early parts of the day so we can begin. One student answered the rabbi, when you see the, an, an animal in the distance and you can tell whether it's a sheep or a goat. Another student answered, when you can look at a tree in the distance and tell whether it's a fig tree or a peach tree. So in other words, you can tell the difference between an, an animal or an inanimate object. The rabbi replied, no. It is when you can look on the face of a neighbor and when you can look into the face of the one who sits next to you and see that is the face of your brother and your sister. If you cannot see this, then the darkness of the night still prevails in your life. And that is how we have to live our lives today as well. We must live with the light and not with the darkness. We must not allow the darkness which presently exists in so many forms to overwhelm us and consume us or even isolate us. It is so easy to fall into the rut of the darkness through pain, through anguish, through giving up. But rather we must turn to each other and to God for help and support. And like the Israelites of old, we have to have the faith that the darkness will soon fade away and that we begin to live our lives with the ever-present and enduring light. And as Jews, remember, we have a mission. And our mission is to bring light to the world, to be an oral agoyim, a light unto the nations. We are charged to do this because we know all too well what darkness is really about. And so let us not only live in darkness ourselves, but let us do the best to lift others out of their darkness 
as we strive to bring light and joy into our, not in, into our own lives, but into each other's lives as well. And may we live to see the day when not only, not only those still held hostage, but all Israelis, all Jews, and all people throughout the world enjoy light in their dwellings. Came here at sun, may it be God's will, and let us say, Amen. 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 Shabbat shalom. Thank you.